realizes own type of energy sometimes raw and sometimes you can't really understand what's going on but i gotta say those moments when it feels like it's in dragon ball z all the moments i'm there for stay tuned as i go over all if not most dragon ball z references and dragon ball z moments in og yu gi -Oh. It was in the late 1990s. Most people really never understood that these digital monsters, that these beasts from another world, that this children card game actually had some like thought put out into it. And what solidified most people that Yu-Gi-Oh was worth giving a shot is when it all came together. In the original four kids dub of Yu-Gi-Oh, where we got the famous clip, my grandfather's deck has no bad cards, Kaiba. Is it bad card? But it does contain the unstoppable Zodia. Exodia! Obliterate! Waving his hands like his Badu or a Sangon, but then firing a key blast like he's showing off his big bank attack with all three Lightning Yellow Dragon. Did I say Lightning Yellow Dragon? <laughs> uh, sorry, the big lady in me is talking. The three blue eyes white dragons getting eviscerated. Because back then you could just summon them without having to do any tributes. And Kaiba, really now knowing what the taste of defeat and the taste of fear is, truly does get humbled. And that's when the rivalry starts between our main protagonist Yami Yugi with his sidekick and also side main character Yugi Moto and then you have the rival Seto Kaiba of course you could say some parallels for Yami Yugi and Yugi Moto is kind of like the reference of like there is the childlike side of Goku which is in Yugi Moto but then you also have the serious side of Goku which is in Yami Yugi whenever you see Goku like turn up the brakes get serious his eyes squint down and you also see the fact that it's taking a more serious stance in the battle in OG Dragon Ball Z it kind of reflects what we see in Yami Yugi that's only when we see that the gear are turning up, lives are at stake, and the battle that we're currently seeing is for the fate of the world. And that's what you also see in Dragon Ball Z. Whenever you see Goku turning out the brakes, then you always see him squint his eyes at the Transformers stay base, but is always level-headed, always ready to win the battle. Not by cheating, but by showing that he can break through his own limits. And with the rivalry of Seto Kaiba and Yami Yugi, that really feels as if that's just Vegeta and Goku having been your rival the first match whenever you guys meet each other, to then having your arch rival keep coming and challenging you over and over again. Wanting that run back, wanting to win, wanting to taste what victory is like. Having an eternal rival that sometimes you guys team up and try to be the bigger evil. Sometimes he reverts back to his old ways and tries to beat you. And hell, sometimes he's even just a good motivator to realize that you shouldn't give up on your dreams. And when I mean dreams, I mean just don't, you know, give up in general. Seto Kaiba's stubbornness and Vegeta's stubbornness are both, I want to say inspirational. Inspiration is not the correct word to use. They're both admirable and I'm rooting for them. But you know, the last thing we see of Kaiba is he basically gave up his whole life to go and fight, you know, the Pharaoh one more time as his body dissolves in what looks to be a kind of dark is shading away dust aura. That's what I call commitment. Now, of course, there are other characters in the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe that I might want to say there are more to Dragon Ball characters. My favorite one would always be Joey Wheeler. Joey Wheeler, hands down, was one of the reasons why I watched Yu-Gi-Oh! as a kid. His comedy, his banter, even though his dueling style is nothing like the main character, he still pulls out a, you know, he pulls out a win. And my favorite arc is with Merrick, and only because of his stamina, and also the fact it was also a goddamn duel to the death. Joey he didn't have that polarimer like Yugi did, but he still got some respect at the end. And that reminds me of early Dragon Ball Krillin. Back then, in the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournaments, when he had to fight Piccolo Jr. for the first time, Goku warned him, saying the fact that if you go in and fight, there's a chance you may lose. There's a chance you may die. So be careful, my best friend. Krillin still went in and overcame the odds so great. He didn't win. Let that make that clear. Same with Joey. He didn't beat the main villain, but that's obvious because it's, goddamn, it's a shonen. You can't really beat the main villain with a side character. That kind of, like, defeats the stakes of the story. But Krillin got the respect of Piccolo. Showing off moves we never even considered. Showing Piccolo that you can't just put your arms down and not do a thing to beat me. Nah, 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 nah. You gotta actually put a little bit of effort. And Krillin, like a badass as he was, left on his own terms. Realizing the fact that he showed off everything he could. He did everything he could. Not willing to humiliate himself. He surrendered the battle. But he didn't lose the respect of Piccolo, nor did he lose the respect of everyone who's watching. And then you look at Dragon Ball Super Superhero, and then you like... Oh. Oh, Krillin, how the mighty have fallen. Good God! And this one being my final character that I think is from the Dragon Ball universe in a way, Bakura. A good guy taken over by the Millennium Ring. The Millennium Ring kind of being a parasite in a way. Taking over its host, making their body become their own new vessel. Doing unspeakable actions on the world. Wanting to destroy the world. Conquer it. Enslave it. Overrule! Also, I watched Transformers Prime recently and I'm like, that Megatron quote is so 
good. Tell me why I should welcome back someone whose every waking impulse has been to thwart me, undercut me, overthrow me. Now back to business. Bakura's evil side had the makings of Baby from GT, but with the motivation of Frieza. Baby had the motivation to get back his planet that he lost. Though in doing that, he became the monster that, you know, he was trying to fight against. Frieza was just raw evil to the core. And with that, Frieza had the evilness. Baby had the parasite-like powers. You mix them together, you get Bakura. But those are really the characters that I could find for Yu-Gi-Oh! But I didn't really finish when I talked about the moves of Yu-Gi-Oh! See, White Lightning from the Blue Eyes White Dragon. Boy, you ain't telling me that's the Kamehameha. Then you are stupid on so many levels. One is with the arm, the other one is with his mouth. Either way you see it, that is a giant BEAM! Shot your opponent at light break speed. Hell, even when Seto Kaiba says the name, it sounds like he's just trying to yell Kamehameha, but he just has to say White Light. White Lightning! And then you got the inverse Kamehameha! For the Exodium, ooh, I think I'll probably more call that kind of one arm angry Kamehameha more than I'll call it the actual traditional Kamehameha. Oh boy, this move. But a move that has a drawback that gives you a power up is what I define to be similar to the Kaioken ability. Having the drawback that your body can't move after you use the Kaioken, and then you see that in this little seal of, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce the name, how Wentz used may give you that power up that you needed, but at what cost? It should have been me, not him! So a big part of Dragon Ball Z was also with his transformations. You can often see his transformations being kind of sprinkled among a lot of anime media. Yu-Gi-Oh! is no different from that. Quite literally, it's in the opening. When you see my boy Yugi Moto transform into Yami Yuki, his hair spikes up. When he presents himself after the transformation is said, his hair comes up, his eyes sprint down, and that's when you see he transform to Super Yugi. And even while Yugi was working on his Millennium Puzzle, in the manga exclusive, he says, at least in his mind, he says, huh, you know, after you complete the Millennium Box, it said that it could grant you a wish. Just like Dragon Balls. Mm, 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 mm. Is it just me or that one of the best duels in Duel Monster was with Yugi versus Pegasus? The battle against the person who's literally stolen his grandpa, stolen the souls of Seto and Seto's brother, and can also read your mind? Ooh, that's a tough ability to be. But with a combination of Yami and Yugi's kind of brilliantness, swapping between roles, not letting the other person know what they're doing. A part of me looks at that and says, huh, you know, I wonder if this is the blueprints for what we saw for Dragon Ball Super. When Goku fought Hit the first time in the Dragon Ball Super manga, the way he overcame him was very much different than using the blue Kaioken. You see, he relied purely on his speed of switching, saving the full power at the last second, by going from God to blue only when it's about to hit the impact having that little switch right there maybe it's a stretch of what i'm saying maybe i'm talking out of my ass but having the fact that yami and yugi kept switching constantly to try to confuse his enemy and then you got goku switching between his two forms god and blue to confuse hit and something i say is absolutely something that a series truly wanted to inherit from dragon ball is dragon ball z's ending and i'm not talking about z's ending i'm talking about dragon ball gt's final episode which in my Ed is kind of like a canonical ending to Dragon Ball story. Until in Dragon Ball Super when they kind of like redcon it and then having its own alternate ending, which hopefully will be good, but we'll have to see, you know, five years from now. Within Dragon Ball GT's ending, we had the conclusion of Goku's journey, departing off to another world. After talking to his friends, rivals, foes, saying his peace, saying his goodbyes, living on his legacy, and saying goodbye to the viewers that watched him for over a decade, that this is the end of my story. Similar to that, in Yu Gi Oh! ending. A Tim, finally learned his name, no longer Yami Yugi, gets his final duel with Yugi Moto, loses graciously, and then enters the afterlife of the Pharaoh, saying goodbye to rivals, his friends, and even Yugi Moto, who he has considered as family. It was a bittersweet end, cause same with both endings, it made me cry. Saying goodbye to the character that we had seen their journey. Lucky enough for us with Goku, he's returned back on the big screen, but with a Tim, man that boy is gone. We may have had a little bit of more closure with that Yu-Gi-Oh movie but truly I gotta say seeing him walk to his own afterlife something that he's been wanting at least one of the three things he wanted which was his memory which he got to fulfill his purpose of why he was brought back which he got and the third thing is to finally rest in peace I love Dragon Ball Z and I love Yu-Gi-Oh and pointing out the details that make them similar but also make them different is something I love to do but until next time thank you for watching you guys stay safe and peace